Was popping, was popping, was popping. Welcome, Nikki and Moose. I'm Nikki. That's Moose. What's up, Moose? What up, y'all? And we are on episode 54. <laughs> and this is going to be a good one. We're going to talk about, of course, Facebook going down. Yes. Mm. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Um, And the conversation of ownership or partnership or independent or mm. you can't bet on yourself. It's It's a lot today. Um, really good conversation. Moose, how are you feeling about this episode? I mean, we're going to give you an opportunity to look at a few different options of what's happening out there in the industry. And the cool thing is all of the examples today are actually big time brands. So like the exclusivity of saying you only have to be big through big company or through partnerships or through this, you get to choose, you know what I'm saying? So that's what today's about. Yep. Let's get into this intro. Two kids from Queens, cut from a different cloth. Now, joining forces, helping you to elevate your personal brand. Yeah, I'm talking about Nikki and Moose, bringing you a never before seen perspective into the mindset, the mentality, the behaviors, the driving force, but more importantly, the stories behind the people and brands that you know and love the most. And let's get into the review of the week. All right. This one says, these are slept on. Okay. I thought, mm. Okay. All right. Nikki and Moose have the perfect combination of peanut butter and jelly with their chemistry and approach when talking, uh, wait, talking all the things, current events while finding the branding and business lessons in them all. Listening to them is an investment in making all you do better. Wow. As long as the message, the, the, the point of our podcast is getting through. They said current events, mm -hmm. branding and business. We do it good. We do it that's, good. That's literally, yeah, I was going to say, that's literally what, what it's intended to be. So if y'all pick that up, man, thank you. That, uh, that lets us know we're on the right track. Yep. So make sure you leave us a review. On Apple Podcasts, and I think Pod Chasers too, but the main one is Apple Podcasts. We read them all. You could be on the show. We shout you out. So shout out to everybody who leaves us a review, and shout out to our audio listeners and viewers. You know what I mean? Mm. We appreciate you. And Moose, how are you feeling? Man, pretty good. I'm. Uh, I don't know if you see my my. My my light colors, my my pinstripe fall I see it. cream I colors. I see it. Looks you know springish. I mean, yeah, it's like you you're transitioning into fall, but you really don't want to say by the spring summer kind of vibe. But um, yeah, it's working. out. I feel pretty good. That's a, a, my a, way of saying. It's I feel an good Easter today. vibe for me. It's a it's an Easter. Ooh. It is. You might maybe I gotta pull it back out then. I'll just I'll I'll shelf it and pull it back well, out. Well, at least you know what you're wearing for Easter Sunday. I'm just saying. Facts. Hey. Hey, you know what I'm saying? You got to be better safe than sorry. You ready? And uh, and let me say, I saw your little work workout kind of routine uh, on the oh, gram. Uh, the don't say too much. Thanks. <laughs> 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 thanks. Uh, appreciate it. He's working uh, out, people. That's all, I guess that's all I could say. Hey. Uh, Moose well, is, you, is working you out. You know, I hurt my back. You know, I have I heard my back. I told you about that. My back was was blew out for like two weeks. It was. Yeah, it was bad. It was really bad. Then I can't say anything because I, I was like, "You look great. You were squats and everything." But mm. never mind. Never happened. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's bouncing back. Okay, you know, it's it's coming back. Yeah. How are you? How are you feeling? I, I'm great. Uh, I'm yeah. great. <laughs> okay. I mean. I'm starting to sweat oh. here. Figured I'm I mean, ask you a question. Yikes! It really is getting hot here. Let me take I'm this sorry. off for a second. Save it back for Easter. <laughs> Bring it back up for Easter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> for all our viewers, you will know what we're talking about. Audio people, just go on YouTube and and see what was the Easter shirt, which was still really nice mm. because I'm wearing black and you were bringing color to the. Yeah, to the podcast. Add a little life to the screen. Right, yeah. 
Right. Now we got to just right. concentrate on my red and orange. But that's cool. That's cool. I'm with Thanks. it. I'm with it. But um, let's talk about. <sighs> All right. Let's just go into this Facebook situation. All right. So. Yeah. Depending on when you hear this, what what date was that? Let me let me get my facts right. Uh, it was a Monday, so it was October fourth, where everybody uh, didn't know what to do with their life. Mm. Okay. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, Messenger, all went down for like eight hours. Um. Mm. I will say this. I never realized how weird it was <laughs> to like check it as much as I did and it didn't work. I was like, oh, I have a I have a problem. I have a problem. And wow. I was trying to I was trying to be like, oh well, I have to, you know, because I gotta see what's happening and when it's up. That's part of me. Like I gotta, but right. I realized. Like, I'm always working and then I'm sneaking in there. Right. Like, <laughs> I was. Well, hey, at least you're being honest with yourself. I don't think uh, that many people are going to be honest with themselves and say, shoot, I might have a, a Instagram addiction low key. Yeah, I, 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 I low key do. I low key do. But <laughs> yeah, it was. It was, <laughs> it was like back to back, too. It was like, oh, it's down. Mm-hmm. Two seconds later, I was picked it up like, oh, let me check my other account. Like, my other account's going to make any As difference. As if that's going to magically work, yeah, right? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was bad. But I didn't even care about Facebook. That's the bad part about it. Like, they were like, mm. oh, Facebook's down too. I was like, I don't care about that. What about Instagram? Yeah. But needless to say, there's a lot of rumors about why it happened. There's, it got hacked. Um, the craziest thing, ooh. This is what I did want to say. This Mm -hmm. is where tech goes wrong. So I don't know if you saw the tweet where it was like, um, I think it was done by TechCrunch, where it's saying, since Facebook is down, Facebook employees can't get in because their badges won't work. I was like, oh, wow. Oh, this is when tech goes wrong. So they can't get into the building? They couldn't get in. Supposedly. Wow. Yeah, that that was wow, wow. that was a tweet. I was like, oh wow. That yo, mm. social media controls everything. Wow, that was weird. But so one of the speculations is that there was this 60 minutes that came out about this Facebook whistleblower, right? I had no clue what it was. Clearly, it was a former Facebook employee spilling the beans. Now, there was Mm. a part of it that I wanted to talk about in the context of when you want to stay relevant, what route do you go? So let me show the clip and audio people, you hear it so you know what I'm talking about. And one of the consequences of how Facebook is picking out that content today is it is optimizing for content that gets engagement or reaction. But its own research is showing that content that is hateful, that is divisive, that is polarizing, it's easier to inspire people to anger than it is to other emotions. Misinformation, angry content is enticing to people and keeps them on the platform. Yes. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. Mm. Mm. Wow. So, Moose, how do you feel about that clip hearing that, A, Facebook is doing it, is showing you all the wrong stuff and things that could possibly get you mad, right? And (laughs) weird part, I don't think I experienced that on Facebook. I don't know if you experienced that, but I don't. Like the the way they have this whole narrative of uh, false news and misinformation and all these bad things, I don't see that on Facebook. Granted, I'm not all the way every day on mm-hmm. Facebook, except for this yeah. week lately. But mm-hmm. I, what do you think about it? 
Man, I think it's so interesting, right? So there's a, I'm, I'm almost in the middle of this, right? Because from one side of it, I understand people's concerns with their privacy and their information and all that stuff. And look, I, I'm not for complete invasion of privacy, but the fact that they make the experience easier, mm -hmm. right, by being able to show you more relevant things, I think that's a positive, right? Especially like they say, well, if we didn't use the platform or make the platform the way it is, when you search for something specific, mm -hmm. there's no way that you would get exactly what you're looking for. Like, I, I don't know who I saw breaking this down, but they were saying, imagine you were looking for how to best season steak. And then you found videos coming up on the first page about the best toothbrushes and maybe toothpaste. That would be pretty frustrating for you as a user. Right. right. So they were saying that they almost come hand in hand, this concept of being able to utilize your information mm -hmm. is because it makes their system better. Now, the, the area where I have to draw the line, because I think it becomes more a, a, an issue because of culture and, and company values, is this idea of you knowing that this is how it contributes to maybe violence hatred, right. things of that nature. And you are choosing not to put a limit on that mm -hmm. because you want more people to spend time on the platform. Because again, that's how it translates to more dollars in your favor based on the advertising and marketing that you do with other companies or businesses or offerings that you bring to the marketplace. So that's for me where I draw the line, Nick's like, if we're saying, hey, and especially because Zuckerberg has made multiple appearances you know, in government or in whatever court saying, hey, you know, this is what we stand on. We're very X, Y, Z, and this is what we believe. We want to make it all equal for people. But you're not putting the actions in place to actually live out that belief system. So that's for me where it becomes a little problematic because it's like, dang, like you're saying that's what your company believes in. But that's not what you're doing behind the scenes from an operational sense to actually live out those values. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a big hypocritical move for me that I'm like, ah, I know I understand how it makes things better for us as users. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to this part of it, especially if you have the opportunity to choose to limit that and you letting it go, then that lets me know that, you know, it's, it's more your whatever is in your favor above the well-being of the world or the people or the community or all the users on Facebook as you claim it to be about. But that's not what it is, I see. Yeah, it's, it's, when I think about it, I don't think I'm too shocked by the situation. Like, Facebook isn't as relevant as it used to be, right? Because you used to hear uh, MySpace and then that died, and then it was just all Facebook, right? And then other stuff started to pop. Twitter, uh, Instagram, that's why they bought Instagram, uh, TikTok, like YouTube. It's just a lot of things that Facebook may not be number one or even two anymore, right? So, but the weird thing about this is the one thing that pops in my head when I think about like anger and violence and not to bring up this man in any kind of way, but when Donald Trump said what he said, and then there was this whole riot, right. That was all over the news. I think that was on Twitter. I think he said that on Twitter or something. And mm -hmm. it caused this whole crazy protest that, like took down the capital and everything. I don't see that same energy on Facebook, but we've talked about it in past uh, episodes where just because I don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. Right. Based off what this person said, it just seems a bit desperate. It just seems like we already know and, and here where it's kind of the lesson is, is like, we know emotion makes people do stuff, makes people engaged. Now, 
Sad doesn't make people want to engage too much. Happy is a good emotion that, you know, want to spread positivity. But they choose not to go the positive route, which still has engagement. I think because they're not as on top as they used to, they can't necessarily do the positive route. Now, when people hear this, does it mean, okay, well, if it's not working anymore, do I go the negative route? Do I go making people angry and getting them to engage in that kind of way? And we've seen it where people will post like controversial posts just for engagement, even minor right. stuff, right? And we know that works, but that you have to look at the values of your own brand and business. And does it align with that? And just because things may not be working or you may not be getting the same money as you used to. Is it worth really taking that route of always being known for the person who stirs up the pot? Always being known for the brand that says something that could be true, but we're not really sure. But it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. Like, regardless if it's true or not, that's entertaining. We're going to talk about it. So I look at it more like a lesson on what emotion are you trying to evoke for your audience, period. And like staying true to that, regardless of the waves of business and entrepreneurship. Because mm -hmm. you could get very desperate in those low peaks. You could get very desperate when the money isn't looking like how it used to. So, I, like, I get why Facebook is doing it. I just, you know, I just can't agree with it. But supposedly it's working. You know, like, I can't. I can't say, no, don't do it. Like she, in that 60 minute, because I, I watched the whole thing, was like, I. she worked at Google. She worked at uh, Pinterest. And she was like, I came mm. to Facebook so I could work with the department to get rid of all the false information. Mm. And realizing it was never going to happen. And I'm like, there, there's always the villain in a, in a crowd. There's always hmm. the person who does the opposite of what's supposed to happen. But it's so, they'll just put a sticker on it like, oh, you know, false information. Or they'll do maybe some things that they'll take some information down but keep others up, you know. Yeah. And it's like. As, as users as well, though, we are very, we get influenced very easily. And how we, how do I say this? How we get our thoughts sometimes is based off what we always see, right? Whether it's on the news, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's in the website, whatever it is, if we continuously see something, some of us may be like, Oh, true. This mm -hmm. is how life is. This is what this is, right? But I think also as consumers, we have to be a little bit smarter. Like, we have to look at it on, like, what is this source? And yeah. should we believe it based off what we continuously see on this platform? And do we see the same information on other platforms. Yeah, I will say, and, and I, I want to ask you a question here in just a moment, but I do think that part of it is our fault, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't think that everything that happens in this world is a result of the big bad wolf, right. the big company, the big mm -hmm. corporations, the bad CEOs. Like, yo, you played into the narrative, yeah, right? Like, yes, 
And again, you could say, well, they have these psychological tactics to know that we're going to enjoy negativity and drama more than positive light. Yeah. But but you helped them fund it. Like you helped them figure that out about you. You played into it. You kept pushing that agenda. And guess right. what? It gave them the green light to do it. And no one, you know, no one called them out on it. But at the same time, and this is kind of where I want to ask you, like, I understand business, right? Like mm-hmm. there's a part of business where it's very black and white. You remove emotion from it. I'd like to believe that, hey, at one point, you get so big that you really got to start taking into consideration the well-being of humanity, especially when you have over 2 billion people on your platform yes. or whatever it is. Yes. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm off with that number, but it's, it's close. They got a lot. And I'm, and I'm looking at Facebook as Facebook and Instagram because right. they own Instagram, yes. right? So I'm looking at both of them together. So I guess my question for you is, let's say you're CEO, you're CEO of Facebook and Instagram right now. Mm-hmm. How do you navigate that concept as an as a owner of, from a business standpoint, do I keep just solely focused on growth of the platform, making sure user time is through the roof? Or at some point, do you start saying, hold up a second, like, we're actually out of pocket because of this, this, and that. What's the what's the balance in your perspective? How would you run it? Uh, for me, it's 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 values always m- over money all the time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which in this case may not be so beneficial and uh, revenue generating at times, right? Because right. we already know like facebook is in just any platform we know entertainment sells we know entertainment right. is the most that people truly watch and and engage yeah. with now yeah with that there's a good side of entertainment and a bad side of entertainment if there was stats that clearly people are dying, um, harming themselves, and and those natures based off the information that they see on the platform, that's a different scenario. And I mean a good significant number, not a certain percentage, because a certain percentage could play off of anything. Like I think sometimes we find reasons to blame somebody else besides ourselves or besides the true reason why things happen right like right. random side note when uh somebody did you see the one about geico did you see that Mm-mm. which one's okay that? so mm. side note but it'll go right back around so a female sued geico because they caught an std in a car that was insured by Geico. Oh, wow. Right. So instead of suing the individual that got you that CD, you are now suing the insurance company of that the car is covered by? Weird. So I say all that because not saying that some content that is out there could truly affect people, but I believe in certain cases, we cannot say yay or nay if right. Facebook is the true reason why this is happening or that's happening. They're just not helping. They're not helping the cause, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, s- same reason with with the whole COVID situation. We know we can't say this event gave us COVID, right? Mm-hmm. But it may have played a factor. If I didn't have to go there, I possibly wouldn't have gotten it. Possibly. I don't know yet. Right? No, I don't have COVID. I'm not saying I have COVID. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what what I'm saying. But I'm, I'm saying that to say that if there is a true significant number that shows that it is negative, like what we're doing is negative, I would, I would have to change the direction somehow, some way. If it doesn't, Mm -hmm. and there's just people, there's billions of people in the world. Like you really got to look at it and like, okay, who is, is it truly 
misinformation. Now, I'm assuming it's true because mm-hmm. I've heard that countless of places about Facebook. Countless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, well. Hmm. What? what I will say, I mean, I just think that it, whenever we choose to just be honest and transparent, believe it or not, the growth effect mm-hmm. is just as impactful, yes. right? Even if you can't measure it in dollars. And what I'm trying to say is, let's say the CEO was like, you know what? This is actually going to, it's at a point where it's becoming harmful to the public and our users. Yeah. We have so many users that the domino effect of this is going to be problematic for just the entire world, right? right? When you look at events like, you know, the takeover in the capital or just some of the things that happen around the world, you're, that, you're influencing literally how people are living their life or what they're choosing to do or what stance they take. You got to be a little bit more careful. Yeah. I wish it was the approach of let me be transparent and come out and say, hey, we're choosing to limit X, Y, Z, which I'm sure at that point when when the platform is so big, you can't satisfy nobody. Right. If you were to come out and say, oh, we're going to limit this type of content because it's creating this type of effect, I'm sure some people are going to come out with that. Well, give me the opportunity to choose. Mm-hmm. But in my opinion, I think when you stick to the facts and say, hey, we've let it run on for a while. Here's what some of the impacts have been or negative side effects as a result of it. Mm-hmm. So as a because of that, now we're going to take this approach. So it's like, if you can be more transparent, you don't give ammo to a, a whistleblower to come out and kind of like show, flash, the, you know, flash your cars and be like, oh, wow, look at what they've been doing behind the scenes this whole time. So I think from a business standpoint, the way you move and operate, if you can, if you can not keep any skeletons in your closet and, and be more proactive about, hey, we're, we want to make things right. We won't be perfect. We won't satisfy everyone because we're too big. Somebody's going to feel offended or not happy with the stance that we're taking. But I don't give ammo to anyone to come out and kind of do this whole 60 minutes thing. So I'd like to kind of see the balance of it, too, from a business standpoint. Like if you're a leader in that type of position, be more transparent. Don't leave any skeletons in the closet. That's good. <laughs> So, um, let's talk about Tina Turner. I wish I had like a sound for her, like her little Hmm. sound, but I don't. The headline is another blockbuster deal. Tina Turner sells her entitled, entitled, entire, oh my goodness, entire catalog to BMG, right? And it was reported that this was a fifth. $50 $50 million dollar deal. Hmm. Now, there has been a lot of mixed reviews about this, a lot of criticism, because some people were like, how could you sell your whole catalog? Like, why would you do that? Why would you give that up, right? And I think this is where me and Moose are going to kind of go back and forth about it, because for me, I'm going to be honest. She's 81 years old. Mm. It's $50 million. She's 81 years old. I'm not sure. I'm not saying old girl's going to die anytime soon. I'm not saying that. But I think for the amount that she possibly has left, I think 50 and including the stuff that she's already had. And ensuring that her music and her legacy kind of lives on with this particular move, I don't necessarily see anything wrong with this particular move. Now, there's other people who've sold their whole catalog for a crazy amount of money as well, but they're not Mm -hmm. 81. You see what I'm saying? Like, they're kind of, like, younger, a lot younger, yeah. right? I think even the dream did something. The dream is like 40, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's been other people, but, and I'll, I'll probably look it up when you're talking, but what is your stance? Is this a good move? Is this a bad move? She's still signed to Warner Brothers, mm-hmm. right? Um, 
So she's still catching some royalties here and there based off her, like, I don't know, decades worth of music. It's not like she's mm-hmm. out here about to make a hundred, another album and stuff. It's just, I, I don't know. I With this it's, particular it's interesting. one. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, it's... Mm. It's interesting. For I feel like we gotta speak in the in the allegedly's here, just because there's a lot of unknown factors. Right, but right. let's speak with some hypotheticals, right? Okay. So so I think for me, I just looked up her net worth. Yes. And her net worth is two hundred and fifty million. So. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, you got you got some some big paper there. So right. so the 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 way I look at it is, I, if I if I would if I were uh. I'm not gonna say uh, Tina because that sounds weird. If I were Tom, right? I'm just make sure maybe Tom, a, a, abbreviate her name to Tom. Okay. Tom Turner, right? I don't Tom know. Turner. And no, but I'm just I'm I'm joking. As long if, as I you were, don't say Ike. if I were, <laughs> right, <laughs> if I were, right, if I were, if I were her position, right, I would consider that number against my net worth. So 50 million, you have a 250 million net worth. That's about 20 percent of what you currently have. Okay. Is it worth it? And I almost spin the question back to you. Is it worth it to give away your entire or your lifetime's body of work for 20% of what you're currently worth? Do you think it's worth it? So this is the thing. I don't Mm -hmm. know if... Okay, so who was it? There was somebody who was saying, if you don't know what to do with your masters, they're pretty much worthless. Right? Mm. She may not know what to do with it. Right? Or she may not own it per se. Like maybe her and Warner Brothers came up with, um, with a deal with them so she could finally get some money off of it. I, we don't necessarily know the back end because I'm, I'm thinking back then, th- this is why some people are just coming out with their albums and their albums came out in the 90s and the 80s. And now you're starting to see them on streaming because some people are remaking their albums so they can own the masters because they don't own it yeah. and they weren't going to put it on streaming, right? Right. So we don't know if that's one of those kind of situations where she didn't really have a hold of it per se. And if we're, if we're, when you read the articles, pretty much everywhere, US Today, CNN even covered it, um, Rolling Stones. And she was like, I, I feel in full confidence that, you know, my legacy and my music is going to live on you know, even past me. And for me, I'm like, if your kids are good, if your grandkids are good, you know, everything's taken care of. Your your net worth is amazing. At 81, getting a good guap of money when you were coming up, not you, Moose, but when she was coming up, 50 mil was probably not even heard of. Right. You right. know, you have to put that kind of under consideration. Now, if she was, I don't know, in this era, right, and understanding ownership a little bit more, I would say maybe things would be different. But she didn't, she didn't come from this era where now owning your master's is something normal. You know, doing things independently is the the thing to do according to certain people, right? She comes Mm -hmm, from, mm -hmm. I got to be on a record label. I need the machine. I need certain groups of people to always have their hands in my career. And she may be perfectly fine with that. I don't know. I just know at 81, I cannot necessarily be mad that you just got, Hmm. 50 mil is really an undisclosed deal, but they're rumoring yeah. it to be 50 mil. I can't necessarily be mad yeah. at that when you already have a good amount of money in the bank. 
No, this is true. Yeah, no, I can't argue with that. I mean, that's a big payout. 50 million at the end of the day. <laughs> it's still a big payout. I'm just, it's not yeah. one mil. Yeah, it's not no, 20 real. mil. Yeah. It's yeah, 50. Yeah. No, nah, you're in the eight figure. I mean, yeah, no, that's a, that's a big number. I'm just, that's just me. <coughs> Excuse me. That, yeah, that's just, that's just me. But kind of transitioning into the talk of ownership, independent, the machine, all that great stuff. Moose actually uh, gave me a really dope clip from Russ on this, uh, what was the podcast or the series called? Uh, Idea, Idea, Gen- Idea Generation is the, the name of the show. Yeah, they came up with a really good series and Russ was the very first guest and Russ is is an interesting character. Like he is a very successful rapper that people don't necessarily like for some reason, but Mm -hmm. made a lot of money. We're going to talk about it, but here's the clip that Moose uh, introduced me to. If it wants to play, of course, here we're at. Hold on people. You know how this goes sometimes. Um, but as we wait for, huh? I said, hang tight. I'm just telling people, hang tight. Watch it play twice or something. Right. It's going to play twice. And while I'm talking, it'll come I up. learned that the whole industry is ran by just like, it's a couple people. If you know that guy at Spotify, that guy at Apple, you know, this person at Rhythm Radio, this person at Urban Radio. Between four people, you can run the whole. Which is why at a certain point you decided you didn't need. Because I knew the four people and had the money. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'm good from here. Hmm. Moose. Yeah, I think the conversation on this one is what's more important, resources or relationships? And Mm. the reason why I'm saying that is because, and granted, in this clip, he's telling you he already had the money. He had the resources, let's say. But in some cases, if you don't have the resources or if you have the resources without the relationships, it, I don't know that it clicks. So maybe it's a combination of both. But I think what, what I'm getting out of this here is the importance of, yes, have your own resources, have your own funds, right? I think th- when you fund yourself or when you have the money to, uh, you, you have your own financial backing, that is, you have more freedom and flexibility as to who you can work with, who you don't want to work with, because you're not financially tied to one specific source, right? So I, I've noticed that that's always a, a, cr- a key ingredient, especially if you're someone who cares about freedom and flexibility. But with that, just make sure that you also focus on the relationship. And, and I think that's the second part of the, the, the key, if you will, that he mentions too. It's like, oh, I knew the people and I had the money. So I know, I know early in my career, I didn't focus on the relationships, Mm -hmm. not that I didn't care about other people, but for me, I just always felt like I don't want to be a burden onto other people or onto others. So it's best for me to just rely on self. And then over the last 12 to 18 months or so, I've started to realize like, no matter how quite quote unquote resourceful you are, Mm -hmm. there are certain relationships key relationships that are absolutely necessary for you to continue on your journey or on your growth track. So what I'm seeing here, and I think this confirms for me, Nick, just the importance of both resources and relationships as as a very important thing to have on lock if you're going to go down that independent route. I like that. I like that. I actually Mm -hmm. wrote it down. Might be the title. Might be. It's a potential. I mean, it's a potential. Um, I do agree with you. Of course, he's talking about, you know, coming from a major label and understanding the game. And this is where I love to talk about it because it's just leverage. Like he did the whole major label. He released some some albums on of it on it and experienced the ups and downs. And he made the relationships, like you said. So when you're making the decisions of, okay, what is the point of making these these particular moves? Why am I joining 
this platform? Why am I partnering with these people? Why am I, uh, you know, working with this particular organization? What are you trying to get out of it? Mm. And when you get all the stuff that you're trying to get out of it, what is your exit strategy? So for him, he's like, look, I realized the game. I got it. Now, well, why do I need to be on this anymore? It's not, it's not working yeah. anymore because I feel like I could do this on my own. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, with feeling like, yo, I got all the resources. We're tapped out. Like, you, there's nothing more you could do for me that I can't do for myself. So mm. I think for anybody, y- you have to look at the whole scope of who's, who's talking to who, who's the, you know, the decision makers, how can I get good with them? Yeah. Or even just understanding, like I'll say from a personal brand standpoint, you know, who's, who's the marketer that's making sure all these things are done? Like who's the ads right. person? Who's, you know, who's cutting Talk up this it. content? Who is, um, who's running the admin stuff? Like who's mm-hmm. booking this particular thing? If I know all this, I don't necessarily need to be here anymore. Mm-hmm. So you, you have to look at it like there is a plus of, let's say, joining a team, joining an organization, doing a nine to five, jumping on a big platform, collaborating with certain people, because you're going to be introduced to resources and exposed to certain things that you weren't before. But when you have them, what is your exit strategy? That's what I said. Mm, okay, hold up. I got a question for you. So, do you think? Do you think that move for him mm-hmm. was a matter of efficiency because he doesn't have to put his destin- destiny in the hands of the label, where they're they're business people. They're yeah. thinking like, oh, I got Nikki, I got Russ, I got Moose. Yeah. Which one of these three am I going to put? You know, out front center Mm because i can't do all three quite frankly like resources are limited to an extent right so do you think it's a matter of him like let me cut out the middleman so that i can be more control of my own blow up as opposed to relying on the label to do it do you think it's a matter of efficiency Mm -hmm. or do you think it's more of maybe something else because the way i look at it is like i think the the one of the benefits of being tied to a group Mm -hmm. or tied to a big company or a team or a a large machine and platform, et cetera, is that you're always, you're always front and center some way, somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you get to a point where your team is so good, your brand is so good, your business is so good that you guys are always on, on front street, right? In people's minds, when they see that brand, they think of you too. Mm-hmm. So even if you're not one of the, you weren't the key stakeholder in that move. Like, let's say you guys launched something that was down the alley of, I don't know, branding. Right. But I'm not necessarily in that, in, in that space so much. But people are still saying like, oh, yeah, no, no, that's, that's him too. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the flip side of it, we launched something down business or flight assessment. Mm-hmm. And although maybe that's not your particular space or, I don't know, Val's per space, and I'm just saying anyone, Mm -hmm. but in in the eyes of other people, they're saying, oh, no, 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 that's her too because Mm -hmm. that's them as a unit. So I I guess I'm trying to see what's a better approach. Is it better to say, nah, I want to be more efficient because I can be direct to consumer. I don't got to put my destiny in the hands of somebody else waiting for them to give me my turn, my season, my et cetera, or... Is it, let me be a part of the mix because I'm always in the conversation. I may not be the key. Right. I, may not, I, might, I may not be like, you know, the, the prime keynote or whatever, right. but I'm still a part of the conversation. So what, what, what do you think is, is, the, is a bigger move or a better move? 
I think it depends on the person, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. I don't think yeah. both of those situations um, is like either or. You see what I'm saying? Like, I think certain people need to stay in the mix, yeah. right? Um, just depending where they are or the benefits that it has by staying in the mix. You, some people may not have the same benefits if they did that on their own, right? Or maybe see that this lack actually lasts longer if maybe I'm not playing number one or number two, but they know I'm part of the group. And so it still makes me relevant. And so Mm -hmm. I could still be successful by just being relevant. So Mm. that could be one of those situations. And then there's some people that's like, he, he said, I I don't, I don't have to do uh, meetings no more. I don't have to wait. Like, we weren't seeing eye to eye in certain things and I know what to do. I, I'm pretty much a one-stop shop, like media, visual stuff is already in house. I just got to go to this person, this person, this person. I don't have to wait on this big machine to give me the green mm-hmm. light. Now, not everybody's that way. You know, some mm. people prefer to be, you know, let me just be in the back. Let me be in the mix, but let me be in the back, you know, where other mm-hmm. people are like prime example. Shout out to Carl. Carl's one of those, like, keep me like, I, I'll do the front. Oh, that sounded horrible. I'll be in the front in. Hey, in, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's all right. <laughs> sorry. Um, no, I'll good. be. <laughs> I'll be in I the front, like in front of the camera, all that great stuff once in a while, but I can't like, I don't want to run this. I don't want to take all the control. I'm cool with being led. I'm cool with being in a group that I can leverage. Like I'm cool with mm. that. Um, where maybe for myself, I'm like, I'm, I'm over this last minute stuff i'm over like what is what else needs to be learned so i can leverage and do an exit strategy like so we're two different things still working on the same team but one is really looking at the relationships and the resources to make bigger moves where the other one is looking at relationships and resources and just staying there and being content with it. Hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the questions I kind of had to ask for my, ask myself, I think um, just this last week actually is like, I, I wonder how certain people move when they feel like their potential is not being fully capitalized on. Mm-hmm. And I know the politically correct answer is to be like, well, it's your potential. You should be like, yeah. It's, and I think it's I easier that. said than done in a lot of different cases, right? Yeah, I was like, I don't but, know about that. But it, yeah, it, it, it puts you in that position where you kind of like got to think like, yo, is an exit strategy best? Is it just, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's definitely a question that I think, and, and, and again, for the listeners, I hope you can use a little bit from Russ and even from our own experiences. At some point in that journey, there are pros and cons to every side you choose. Mm -hmm. When you go independent, you got to make the decision that you are going to be the number one guy in your company, in your brand, because guess what? You are, right? So like there are no opportunities for somebody to pick up the slack. There are no opportunities for you to delegate and hope that they can get it done the way you, you know, that because they have some level of ownership into it. Or there are no opportunities for you to just kind of take a back seat because mentally, emotionally, physically, you're going through some stuff. There's really no off days or opportunities to lay out when you're independent, especially, and and again, I'll, I'll kind of leave some room for error here, especially if your industry relies on you to show up every day. Or you've built the reputation as someone who shows up every day, right? And the, th- the cool thing I like about Russ is that before he even signed 
to the label in, I think it was 2017, he had put out 300 independent songs. Yep. You know, so like he had put in a crazy amount of work. Mm -hmm. So for anyone starting off and, and the article that I read, and I think I shared it with you, is that the article that I read, it said like, yo, when you're a startup creator, and, and I never heard the two terms used together, because like startup is only talked about in the entrepreneurship space. Right. It's like bootstrap, startup, et cetera. But a startup creator is a really real thing, mm -hmm. especially in today's world. You're starting up because of the equipment you might need to buy, the things that you might need to invest in, the resources you might need to gather. And this one article was saying that if you get to a point and the pieces of content that you're creating are costing you hundreds or thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. you're not going to have a long lifeline here because you're just starting. That means there's not much money coming in on a single piece of content for you to invest that much money. So being resourceful is important. But again, at the same time, you really have no opportunities to take any time off. Yeah. But then, you know what I'm saying? And then, and I'm just saying like, yo, but the flip side of it, you stay tied to a machine. There are some seasons where you're not hot. Like the label's not going to push you as their main number one. Maybe they got their focus on the new guy. Maybe they got their focus on the old guy or yeah. the old gal who's been kind of like laid off. So, okay, let's give her some love again. So you, you got to kind of, play the game in terms of figuring out, okay, when's my turn again? How can I, whatever. And that's not a fun space to be in. So there's definitely pros and cons to both sides of the table. Yeah, and I have to agree with the, when you were like, you know, it's your fault with the potential, blah, blah, blah. Like, yes. It, and this is, this is a real life situation, right? To Big where facts. you're, you're told Go be great, right? Mm -hmm. But there is not an environment to allow you to be great because there's so many other factors in the platform or the environment that you're in. So, yes, yeah. it is important to be great and maximize on your full potential, but you have entrusted the platform, company, uh, collaboration that you're in that they will position you as well to maximize on your potential. And it becomes harder and harder to where you're almost doing it. I don't know. You're supposed to give your all to, let's say you're at your nine to five to this and you're doing 12 hours, 14 hours a day for a particular project, when are you supposed to be great? Now, granted, some right. people are going right. to listen and be like, spend it at night if it's that important, blah, blah, blah. Ma'am. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. I agree. I do. I've done both. I'm not saying either or. What I'm saying is when you grow up, Right. Mm. When you grow up, you want to make sure that you position yourself to an environment that allows you to tap into your full potential. Yeah. And if you are not in that and it is more of a hassle or not, a, not all the way celebrated when you are in your full potential, you have to reevaluate some things. Thanks. It's like, we, that's a whole other conversation, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Maybe not the show. Maybe not the show. Right, 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 right. But now let's talk about the flip side, right? So mm -hmm. if, if we're talking about Russ and how he went from a major to, let's say, independent. Right. Mm -hmm. Saw success in both, but really took the resources and went independent. We know a different situation where somebody was full independent and went into a major, a major. which is, yeah. of course, late great Nipsey Hussle. Hey. All right. Late great Nipsey Hussle. Now, um, in this clip, that we're going to play, it speaks about how he is, how he's referencing the reason 
of why he went to a major because he saw Rough Riders. He saw uh, No Limit. He saw Rockefeller and what they've done by partnering with a label. And this is the clip we got. And these dope brands that was homegrown, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, movements that turned into mainstream situations. Gotcha. But they did it on their terms. Gotcha. And, and they, and they, they leveraged <clears throat> the type of deals that, you know, they maintain their executive mm -hmm. status as they went into the mainstream, into the majors. And that was my goal, you know what I'm saying? To be that a, leverage. Yeah, to mm -hmm. operate as a, as a partner, operate as a business, as all money in, not like... I got to go in as Nipsey by myself. Gotcha. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, you know, from my experience and my study in the game, you losing power. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot more power um, being able to operate as a company. Mm. So, um, there's two ways I want to take this, right? First way is... I like how he referenced, you know, Rockefeller and everything. You can watch that full interview. That's what he said prior to. But using pretty much the opposite of what we were talking about, Russ, using uh, the labels to leverage to get to a higher point, right? He's already created a buzz. He already created a fan base. At that time, he already sold $1,000 mixtapes, not even the hundred dollar mixtapes. He was at mailbox money, which was a thousand dollars and those sold out as well. So the person who asked him the question was like, yo, to me, I don't see the point of you going to a label, but explain to me why you're going to a label. And I think this is more where it stops becoming a me thing and it becomes a we thing. So uh, of course, him himself, Nipsey, can continue to stay successful, but he has a team. He had created a record label and he understood maybe they may not have the same success the same way I do. Let me take the, the success that I have and the leverage I have create a partnership to make sure everybody else is good. So I look at it like that. If we see the people who were running the, the labels as far as like Rockefeller and No Limit and things like that, they always had a point person. And because of that point person, they were able to get the partnerships. So I think that is a smart move with clearly understanding this is what I give to the table. This is what I have. I don't necessarily need you, but I'm creating this. Let's figure out how we could work together. I like that, right? Now, something interesting he said is, you know, with a company, you have more power. So as an individual, you're okay. They may be interested in some type of partnerships, but when you have more to put on the table like a company, then that conversation is a little bit different. And it, it actually made me think like, you know, even in, in some of the situations that we're in, right? Like as an individual, we're great. But if we had offered something as far as what we constructed from a company situation, this is what we have Boom. Is it true that, yo, okay, that's a little bit, that, that gives us a little bit more power. Because I'm from a record label standpoint, I can understand, yo, you're giving us more people that we could possibly make money off of. And understanding you already have a fan base. This is not from scratch. You already are cash flow compared to other people. So when you look at it from uh, a different side, when you are now creating something 
from ground level, instead of just you trying to get certain deals and partnerships, what are you creating that is already cash flow that you could be like, yeah, we could do something, but it has to involve this. This is what yeah, it, it yeah. like got me thinking. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great thought process. And I was even going to just add to that, that in addition to cash flow, you got to think credibility, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that for some reason, there's just that traditional idea of, yo, there's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. So when you step up to the plate and you say, oh, I'm, I represent the company and you're able to use a credible name, like, in, and it just, let's just use for this case, the music business where we're saying Def Jam yep. or Rockefeller, or whoever it may be, right? Well, the association is that this is a well name, a well known brand or a well known company. It's the same thing as when you step up and say, "Oh, I'm the CEO of Apple." Yep. It's like, "Whoa, Apple!" Like you're gonna get a different level of respect. So, regardless of who you're doing business with, they're gonna respond to you differently because they're now recognizing that you are responsible for a major company, mm -hmm. more credibility. So, I think in addition to cash flow, we also got to be asking ourselves, "Man, how can I establish that credibility?" That even if I, at any moment, detach myself from a major company or a major label, right? Do I does my name hold enough credibility that just the name will open doors for me? Right. That's a that's a big that's a big piece of it too, and that's difficult to measure. Like again, it puts you down those path or puts you down the path of things that are difficult to measure. But that's why it's key to have the relationships. Like we even briefly chatted this week about the 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 person who who created Idea Generation, the show that we got that clip from, from Russ. And we were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. His partner worked at Def Jam for two years. Yeah. He was with Complex. They have all these relationships when they launched their new show. It's easy to open up with a Russ and the manager, J. Cole, because, yeah. well, you've worked in that industry for two years. You pull the relationships with you into your next endeavor. So I think, yeah, I, I, I definitely with you on that. And I would also add credibility to the mix. Yeah, and I, and I think... What I like about each of the moves, whether it's from Nip or Rockefeller, is like they still own what they created, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to these major labels and giving it all up just for a percentage or something or just, you know, exposure, right? I think, and, and I think that also plays a role. Like if you just go for self, you may have to give up those things. You may have to uh, just go into bed with them for the exposure, right? But where if you come with a group, right, then an established group at that, that's a different conversation. But as well as now all these people are going to be able to have the relations all these people are yeah. able to have the different sources that others couldn't, you know? So mm -hmm. that's why I'm like, I can understand the, the nip move because now it's, I've seen success, success, but let the whole company now see worldwide success. And mm. that's a different top. I can't do that on my own in this industry. I know right. I can leverage these particular people, this machine to make sure the company is good. I'm good, but mm -hmm. the company needs to be worldwide. And with that move, you know, Victory Lap came out and, you know, the success of that was incredible. Yeah. And how they promoted him was incredible compared to mm -hmm. maybe the very local, uh, sure. you know, word of mouth that he was doing, which was still success. But it's a power move on his end that we don't know how long that partnership would have last. He could have mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. used it and went and finished that contract. We don't know. But yeah. now we've seen from pretty much you know two sides of all right i wasn't i was in a major partnership and i left and then 
I'm going to a partnership. And yeah, yeah. Kind of the the sure. pros and cons of both. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I even heard something on an interview with him uh, just yesterday that through the collaboration, they got the idea to delay the album, mm -hmm. but they were going to put more resources behind them so that he can release the weekend of the NBA All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. And that's like All-Star Weekend in L.A. And they were like, yo, that would be a huge opportunity. And then there were like a few things back to back that just helped them absolutely, you know, explode. Uh, with with that specific rollout. So you're right. Like there are some times where a collab with the machine can help you explode if you've almost maxim maximized your exposure. And and yeah, it, it would have been interesting. I'm sure somebody who starts independent and, and loves their freedom is going to have some form of exit strategy implemented into the contract somewhere. Like, hey, let's do this together. But I do want to be able to, you know, cut ties at any moment it gets too crazy, um, which, which, you know, I mean, everything happens for a reason. But I, I did hear about that. So I, I do think you're spot on, too, with that. Yes. How do you feel about the episode? How do you feel? Man, this was, this was cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's relevant to just everyday decisions that, you know, I'm sure people are going to have to make at some point as they're building their brands and their business. Heck, it's, it's stuff that, you know, I'm sure at some point, if we're not already thinking about it, you know, having to navigate on our own as well. So, yeah, it's cool. Big facts. And uh, make sure you join the after show, right, for my Apple podcast people. We got one clip that we couldn't talk about, but we're going to talk about on the after show. So for my podcast listeners, well, Apple podcast listeners, all access squad, go subscribe to that. Three days free. You know what I mean? So you can hear some of the old after shows. It's really dope. But um, we're going to talk about uh, when you don't really bet on yourself, I think. It's going right. to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. B. Yeah. You know what I mean? Plan B. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. also follow us everywhere at Nikki and Moose. Every single place. Shout out to everybody on Instagram with the over 3,000 followers. Hmm. We're almost at 3,000 on YouTube, and we're almost at 2,000 on Facebook, okay? Hmm. And this is going to be funny because we're going to look back at this and be like, damn, we were that low? This is crazy. Right. So, right. But this is so big for us. So shout out to all our, our supporters. Shout out to everybody who shares this. Continue to share it, all right? Continue. And shout out to, like, Japan, who listens to us. Hey. You know? Hey. Japan. Hey. This is crazy. Um, Moose, real quick. What you mm -hmm. got coming up? You good? He's been traveling, people. He is He is a... I feel like he's going to move to D.C. or something. But um, hey. he <laughs> has been travel. He is a whole trainer, speaker person. Yeah. Yeah, no, things are going good, man. I mean, um, I, I am back in D.C. Uh, later this month, October 21st. I'm going to spend a week in Florida of uh, October 27th to the end of the month. I am now a godfather. Hey! Yeah. Hey! Yeah. My goddaughter's name is Elena. You know okay. what I'm saying? Announcing that here on the podcast. Just born yesterday at uh, 5.23 p.m., so... Uh, Super, super excited about that, man. So we're going to go spend time with the goddaughter at the at the end of the month. And then uh, some stuff in December. Uh, we go West Coast, West Coast December. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly Hawaii. There's actually some talks about some Hawaii stuff. So, um, okay. yeah, I'll keep you posted on that. Yeah. Okay. Our Hawaii mm -hmm. listeners, watch out. Hey. Moose, Moose may be there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Treat them nice. Talk to them nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Talk, uh, talk, talk about it though. I heard, uh, I heard there are some things cooking. Um, um, you know, there's some, some a little, a little, a little some, some cooking on, uh, you know, on. Uh, I'm just being annoying. Nah, go for it. Talk about it. Uh, <laughs> I, all I'm gonna say is deeper than the brand .com. That's all I'm gonna say. Mm. Go check it out if you have some time. I mean, you may like something wow. over there. You may not. Wow. Um, but you know. Uh, but Moose, final words. 
Yeah, I think our word for this week has got to be priorities. I came across something that said, if everything is important, then nothing is important. If everything is important, then nothing is important, right? There are some things that just naturally are going to be more important than others. So get your priorities straight. There's no way everything you're doing is top priority. There's got to be something that's more important than the other.